Hello, how's it going? And welcome to the thrilling conclusion of the concurrent programming series. So, in the previous video, I showed that we could sort of improve stuff on the CPU, you know, up to a certain point. But then even if we made it completely optimal, we were running into a bottleneck. Now, what is that bottleneck? Well, the bottleneck is that ultimately, once we do the work to fill in the color buffer on the CPU, we need to ship that color buffer over to the GPU. The CPU and the GPU are two independent machines. And between them, if you think of them each as a reservoir of memory, between them is a little straw, which is the bus. So the solution to that is to actually not do a round trip to the CPU, but rather just do all of the drawing on the GPU. That is, do the ray casting on the GPU, fill some sort of internal data structure, and then use that somehow to generate the um, output. So today's video will be a sort of a brief walkthrough, but the solution that I found was to do a compute shader. Now, a compute shader is a completely flexible task, which is dispatched in parallel on the GPU. In this case, if we imagine our screen, I'll actually, actually run this just to have something to look at. If we imagine our screen, the task is to draw a vertical line for every X coordinate of the screen. And each of these X coordinates are completely independent. It doesn't matter. Just everything needs to ultimately get drawn. And so the task which is being parallelized is the task of shooting a ray through the X coordinate of the screen, we have 800 X coordinates in a full frame. And so this task will be dispatched 800 times in parallel. And what we're doing is for every dispatch, we're shooting out that ray, we're doing our ray casting, and then we're just measuring two things. We're measuring which color of wall do we hit and how far does the ray travel. And we write that data into a simple buffer, a simple array of size 800. After we do that, I'm dispatching a geometry shader. And that geometry shader reads that info and emits a vertical line for each of those pixels. That's the basic idea. And as you can see, performance is good. Okay, so little more into specifics. So this is the compute shader that I'm looking at, at the moment. I'll just make this a little bigger. That's too big, but anyway. First up, we have the work group size. And the work group size is how many threads to dispatch in one sort of quote unquote work group. Now NVIDIA, I believe, has a typical work group, like a typical warp size, typical thread size of like 32. AMD has a size of 64. And using a size of 64 on a size of 32 is not the biggest crime. So I just, I went with 64. So think of it as every work group is dispatching 64 of these jobs in parallel. We have got, if we go 800 divided by 64 is like some amount that I can't think of at the moment, like, but we round that up and anyway, it's fine. It's totally fine. We've got a number of uniforms. Some of these are set, like for instance, the map size is just set once upon creation of the program, but then the camera position forwards and right vectors are sent over dynamically. They're sent over every frame before we render. Then we've got a buffer and this buffer is basically the map data. So if we were to go over to the scene, this is our world map. Number zero indicates a blank space and any other number denotes a wall color. So I've changed this from a two dimensional array into a one dimensional array because OpenGL likes one dimensional arrays. It's functionally the same. I flash all of this data over at the beginning and then it's persistent in GPU memory. 
So the GPU has a snapshot of the world, basically. Um, the GPU is also going to need a snapshot of all of the colors that I'll be using. So what I've done is if I go over to the renderer, here's my set of all my colors. Again, I flash that over at the beginning of the program and it does not change. Okay. And then in addition to that, the GPU is going to need some sort of buffer to write out to. So we have 800 elements in this buffer. Every element is a VEC4. And the reason it's a VEC4 is we need to store the RGB color of the wall that we hit, as well as the depth, how far the ray traveled to hit that wall. Otherwise, things are pretty much almost the same. I do have this little check at the beginning. So because this is a one-dimensional job, we just really care about the X coordinate of the job. In compute shaders, jobs are sort of indexed. That it can either be a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional job. And then each of these, you'll always have access to like the global invocation ID. And you can get the X, Y, Z. If it's a three-dimensional job, just grab the X, Y, Z coordinates. And that's useful information. But um, because what I'm doing when I work out the number of dispatches is I'm rounding up. I need to have a check to see if, well, if this job is just outside of the range of what I should be doing. But otherwise, I just go through and this is almost directly copy pasting the C code. We even have tertiary, uh, ternary uh, statements here. I mean, it's the same. It's the same stuff. I did minor modifications. Then right at the end, I take the result and just write it into my render state buffer. And this is just, you know, the info is ready to go. Now, what I then do is I dispatch a secondary shader. So I'll just pop into the engine. I know this is a little all over the place, as often is the case, but hey, links down below. So the way my render operation goes is first up, I use my compute shader. Then I send over the camera information. Now, for some reason, it was fine with me fetching these locations ahead of time, but then if I fetch the camera right location ahead of time, it broke. And so the base response in this situation is just not to do that then, I guess. But anyway, then I go ahead, I dispatch my compute shader, and then I insert a memory barrier. Because the situation is that when you dispatch shaders, that is an asynchronous task, like or at least definitely definitely with a compute shader, that's an asynchronous task. And so this dispatch is very quick. The, uh, the compute shader is still working in the background, so I need to insert a memory barrier to make sure that before I proceed with the next shader, the compute shader is complete. There we have it. And the barrier is the storage shader, shader storage barrier because the only thing the compute shader is doing is writing out to a storage buffer. With that all done, I then go ahead and dispatch my drawing shader, which is actually gonna put the graphics on the screen. And what I'm doing is, I'm just doing a dispatch of a single point per X coordinate, and I'm using width 800 for the number of instances. So what an instance is, is sort of saying, hey, GPU, draw this point, go ahead and do that, but do that like 800 times, do it a thousand times or something. And this avoids the, um, well, it's just a way to make it draw basically. So as for the vertex shader, all this is really doing is the vertex shader is going to feed into the geometry shader. And so we just need to output which X coordinate of the screen we're interested in. And we can do that by fetching the instance ID of this invocation. Because remember the instance ID is the variable which is going from zero up to 800. On the geometry side, we declare that we're gonna output really just a single line. And we also have access, read-only access, to the buffer that the compute shader wrote to. So then when we come in here, we're gonna be emitting two vertices, one for the bottom of the wall, one for the top of the wall. 
we've got our X coordinate as the output of the um, vertex shader, just normalized to be between negative one and one. And we can then read back the depth. And if we take one over the depth, that'll make sure that further intersection points are smaller and we can use that info to draw our wall. But yeah, as you can see here, it's, it's very straightforward. Then on the fragment side, so the geometry side, you know, emits the vertices and also outputs fragment color for each vertex. And then on the fragment side, we just take in that fragment color and that's our screen color basically. So very, very simple. But I just, the reason I'm doing this as opposed to writing all this info by hand in the compute shader is I just had the feeling that it was a little wasteful doing a number of write operations on a compute shader where the job is already parallelized. So imagine you've got your, your screen, you've parallelized that, every single little thread is writing per X coordinate, but then if you make that thread write per X coordinate, also draw a whole line. Does this make sense? Anyway, it's not, it's a single threaded thing. It's, it's really bad. Whereas if I then dispatch this on a secondary shader, that secondary shader has all the multi-threading capability that we need, and it can then dispatch for a bunch of different threads, draw each pixel on that vertical line. I hope that makes sense. And anyway, it doesn't need to make sense because the proof of the pudding is in the eating. What is this, 7,400? This is quicker than my Vulcan thing, by the way. My Vulcan thing's just drawing a single triangle, and this is quicker than that. 7,000 frames per second. That's incredible. And as you can see, colors are shifted a little bit, and that has to do with my interpretation of the RGB components. Frankly, I think this looks better. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed this series. I definitely had fun putting it together. It's about a weekend's worth of work. Um, but yeah, it's very cool. And yeah, all the best. Happy coding, happy learning. I will see you again soon. Bye.